hospitals that are failing patients are going to be named and shamed on a new league table. And that's under the Health Secretary's latest plan to fix an ailing NHS. Managers who fail to improve are going to be denied pay rises and face the sack. They'd be relegated from the league table, but senior medics have warned the measures could make patients shun their local NHS trust. Well, the Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, will be the referee in charge of all this. Uh, very good morning to you, morning. Wes Streeting. Um, the question that I posed earlier was that if you have a trust or a hospital which is, you know, at the bottom of a league table, desperately needs the best bosses to go in and improve, why would they do that if they you know, against all odds, can't do it, and you go, right, you're out, and uh, we're going to get someone else coming in. Aren't you just going to have a kind of rolling carousel of people and not the best ones either? Yeah, great question. That's exactly why we're going to incentivise financially getting the best leaders into some of the most troubled trusts. And I speak from experience on this. My own local trust, the Barking, Havering, Redbridge Trust on the London Essex border, has been in and out of special measures over the years, regularly described as a troubled trust, and more impolitely described locally as a bit of a basket case. We now have a still relatively new, um, been there a little while now, Matthew, Chief Executive Matthew Trainer, who's built a really strong leadership team, has empowered his frontline clinicians. So now our trust is known as one of the fastest improving trusts in the country. And some of the reform they're leading, particularly in terms of um, how they're using different approaches to get through waiting lists faster, using the same resource, better productivity, better use of taxpayers' money, most importantly, better results for patients. That's all about great leadership. And I want to see more of that kind of great leadership in some of the most challenged areas. Mm. And not least because when I look at some of the most challenged parts of the country, They've been consistently challenged. So um, just simply sacking the, the, the boss isn't necessarily going to always fix the root cause of the problem. And that's why we need to also provide support to those areas. And we'll do that nationally. Yeah. Okay. But where you have got poorly performing senior managers, and we have had examples of this, the way to deal with that is to manage people out of the NHS, not to give them a payoff in one trust, only to see them reincarnate okay. in a high-paid salary in another trust, which has also been the guilty secret of the NHS for you, far too long. You probably have the biggest job in government right now because I expect that many, many voters voted for Labour in order to fix the NHS. And this, this is the first time we've had you on since the analysis this week by the Lib Dems wow. saying that your Chancellor's increase in national insurance employer contributions could lead to fewer GP appointments because they're not officially under the NHS, they're private businesses, they run themselves, and we could end up losing access to GPs. Now, what's your response to that? Because we were inundated with concerns from viewers who already can't get an appointment with a GP. Um, so you're right, Susanna, that there are some providers of NHS services, like GPs and others, um, who are um, not formally part of the NHS. They're contracted. Mm. Uh, they're effectively private businesses providing a public service. So they're not automatically exempt from employer national insurance contributions. Are you going to make what, them exempt? The, yeah, the, re the reassurance I would provide to GPs and actually other parts of health and care, I, I recognise the pressures. Uh, GPs are actually a big part of Labour's reform agenda, fixing the front door to the NHS. So we'll be working with um, GP leaders... Uh, as we, because I've not actually announced the allocation for general practice and other parts of the NHS yet, so I'm working with um, GP leaders before making those allocations so that not only can we deliver the investment that Are general you practice going to needs, but the reform as well. Are you going to exempt them from the well. National Insurance well, Employer contribution? We're, we're, not, we're not doing a formal exemption, Susanna, but I recognise the pressures okay. and I want to deal with them. The other thing I'd say... So you're going to give them extra budget to pay for the extra tax... So it sort of cancels itself out when it comes to GP practices? Well, we want to make sure that the investment is linked to reform and to make sure we deliver better outcomes for patients. GPs are a big part of that. Um, the other thing I would just say, um, because I, I know that there are people who aren't wild about the decision the Chancellor made on employer national insurance contributions, but that was a difficult, necessary decision to uh, not only 
fix the black hole in the public finances, okay. but that, to be able sorry, to invest in the NHS. That's a political point you're making. No, but it's, so an, impor gonna... it's an important point, Susanna, because yes, people, people, like people like the spending, but they criticise the investment. Yeah. And if people don't like the investment, yeah. they need to say where they would raise the money. And I don't pretend it's been an easy decision. They just decision, don't want fewer right GPs decision. or GP appointments. That's the point, isn't it? Anyway, no, Rich... and we're not going to let we're not going to let that happen. Okay. Okay. Uh, listen, a couple more things we want to talk to you about this morning, uh, including your change of mind on assisted dying. You you once voted for it. You're going to vote against it. We'd like to know why you changed your mind. But you are a religious man, aren't you? You're an Anglican, you're a regular churchgoer. What was your take yesterday at two o'clock when you heard that the Archbishop of Canterbury had stepped down? Yeah, so I'll just um, separate those, those two issues out. I mean, on, on assisted dying, um, my opposition to the bill is actually not, not religious. Um, it's more um, practical uh, about the state of palliative care, end-of-life care in our country and the extent to which the failures in palliative care mean that assisted dying wouldn't give people a real choice. Um, it would become um, not a right to die, but effectively um, an obligation to die because the support isn't there for good end-of-life care where it should be. What does that be. mean you think that palliative care is worse today than it was when you voted for assisted dying some years ago? Um, well, to, thinking back to the vote in 2015, what I said to my constituents at the time was that I thought it was a necessary debate. We needed to get into the more detailed issues of scrutiny um, and therefore I voted in favour of what's known as the second reading of the bill before you go into line-by-line -line scrutiny. But, but I was always um, sceptical about whether I would ultimately vote for the bill to pass through the House of Commons or what's known as third reading. Right. Um, I do think palliative care is, is in a worse state um, now, um, uh, in, the, in the nine and a half years I've been a Member of Parliament, I think things have gotten worse um, for end-of-life care. We've got to fix that. And All I right. think there are some other issues around coercion. But We're... I just want to emphasise that this is a free vote. The government doesn't have a position. Yes, and I, I have that. enormous respect for colleagues who are taking a different view and particularly for Kim Leadbeater and the way in which she's conducting this debate. Okay. I hope that in the and coming what... weeks people will see Parliament at its best, the, oh. in the way, the thoughtful way okay. in which we are debating and discussing what is a really important issue. And on, on, on the I'm Archbishop sorry, hang of Canterbury... Hang on, hang on, I just want to ask you one quick question on this. Um, were you personally stung by Essa Ranson's criticism, criticism of you last week when she discovered that you had changed your mind and you will be voting against it? She, in effect, she said that you, she thought you were a disgrace as a health secretary. It was very personal. Were you stung by that? Um, well, I put it in the context of someone who um, is going through her own health battle at the moment. Um, and to be honest, um, yes, the criticism she made um, was strong and harsh, in, in my view, but also understandable given what she's going through. So I, I'm not going to... Like, part, part of public life and part of being a legislator and part of having the job that I have is you need to be able to take the knocks and the okay. criticism. And I'm certainly not going to criticise someone who is terminally ill um, and who's campaigned passionately on this issue for the vociferous way in which she has put her criticism of me. I, I understand that. And, and I just want to say, not just to Esther Ranson, because there are lots of other people in the same position, um, I, it was one of the things that I have agonised about in making, this, in making this decision, because I know there are lots of people who feel as strongly as, as, as she does, and I do understand that. It's, for me, the risks of it are outweigh um, the benefits, but okay. this is why it's such a sensitive and fraught issue and why I do not criticise okay. at all people who've taken a different view. Worth treating. Health Secretary. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank you. indeed. Thank you.